Okay, apologies for the uh, technological difficulties, but we're ready to go. I'm Adam Late. I'm the chair of the philosophy department, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Julia Jean Nelson Rudd le lecture on uh, non-human animals, or as it's often called, the lecture on the brutes. Decades ago, uh, James B. Nelson made a provision in his will for the IU Department of Philosophy to receive a large endowment after the death of his daughter and only heir, Julia. Upon her death in 1992, the money was deposited in a trust account, and the department is able to spend the interest on that money each year. Julia Jean Nelson was born in Greencastle, Indiana, attended Sweetbriar, DePauw, a girls' school in Berlin, and the Belcourt Seminary in Washington. Her lifelong interest was the prevention of cruelty to the animals, and she was active in this field. She added a stipulation to the Nelson Endowment, saying that the department must sponsor a lecture each year about non-human animals. Now, a little bit about James B. Nelson. Nelson had no direct connection with IU or with the philosophy department. He was born in Greencastle, Indiana, and attended DePaul University and the University of Michigan, where he earned a law degree. He managed some farmlands in Pike County, and then went into the banking business in Greencastle, where he became president of the Citizens Bank and Trust Company. In 1917, he gave up his banking career and, along with an uncle, founded the Fame Laundries in Indianapolis. He built that business into a five-state organization and shared its board until his retirement in 1960. It is believed that his interest in IU developed along with his, along with his friendship with long-term, long-time IU Chancellor Herman B. Wells. Nelson also endowed the philosophy department of his alma mater, the University of Michigan. And we are immensely grateful uh, to the Nelson family for this endowment. It funds uh, the vast, the vast majority of the department's undertakings, our colloquia, our various public lectures, fellowships, on and on. It's a wonderful gift to the department. We're very, very grateful. Our speaker today is Alistair Nora Cross professor of philosophy and director of the Center for Values and Social Policy, both at the University of Colorado Boulder. And by way of introduction, I, I did a little bit of poking around on the web and I have concluded that it is best if I simply read directly from his university webpage, which states the following. Alistair Norcross, PhD Syracuse 1991, was born in the slums of South London the illegitimate child of an Albanian prostitute and the Bishop of Basingstoke. After early childhood stints as a canary in a coal mine and a chimney sweep in Victorian England, he awoke from his dogmatic and delusional slumbers and attended Christ Church, Oxford, where he attempted to study classics, puzzlingly called Literae Humanioris by the locals. Another awakening occurred when he, like someone else before him whose name has faded into insignificance, read Hume <laughs> and realized that he could study philosophy and not have to read Greek and Latin all the damn time. He goes on to report that at Oxford, Julia Annis attempted to persuade him to give up utilitarianism, but only succeeded in making him lean towards the rule rather than the act variety. Unfortunately for Julia, it didn't stick long. Professor Norcross works mainly in ethical theory and applied ethics. He is the author of Morality by Degrees, Reasons Without Demands, which came out uh, from Oxford in 2020. And if I counted correctly, he is the author of some 51 articles. His talk today is titled, You Really Can Make a Difference, Why What You Eat and How You Vote Matters. After the talk, we will have a brief, uh, a brief break and then return for a question and answer. And then I hope you will all join us for a reception, which will be held in a room somewhere nearby. Does anybody know where that is? Matthew, do you know where that room is? 
<laughs> there are tables. Okay, so we will see exactly what happens, but please join us for a reception after the question and answer. So please join me in welcoming Alistair North. <laughs> Well, thank you, and thank you to the Nelson family for the very generous endowment. Um, so, uh, I very, very, very rarely do PowerPoint, uh, and, and and my feelings is oh, just now maybe I should never do PowerPoints. <laughs> I disapprove of teaching using PowerPoints. I think that um, you know, students don't learn very well. I think the vast majority of philosophers are terrible at using PowerPoints. I'm probably one of them. Um, so I, I apologize for the shortcomings of this, um, you know, not, in, not including the technological uh, difficulties. But um, I, um, uh, this is a, a version of a, uh, of a talk that I have previously given, and I, for some reason, decided to make a PowerPoint for that. So. Yeah, we'll, we, we, we will see. Um, I think it should go fairly smoothly if I turn this the right way around. Okay, so um, let me start. So some some years ago, 20 years ago now, I published a paper arguing against eating meat with a special focus on uh, meat produced in factory farms, although the paper itself um, applies to all animal products, um, but the central example is mostly focused on factory farms. And, and the argument focused on the suffering of animals raised for our consumption. And it, be, it began with a fictional story. And I, I'm, I'm going to assume that nobody here has, has read this paper. Um, so I'll just give you a quick uh, account of what the story is. So there's this, there's this guy called Fred. And Fred is the world's biggest lover of chocolate. And um, uh, Fred one day gets into a car accident and everything seems to be fine after, you know, the, he's discharged from the hospital and looks like he's okay. So he um, orders his favorite chocolate cake or mousse, I've forgotten the exact details, from his favorite restaurant. And he's dismayed to find that uh, it basically tastes of nothing. Um, and so he thinks, well, there's something wrong with this. So he orders a, a, a different chocolate dessert that also tastes of nothing. Um, he goes to several other restaurants and stores buying his favorite chocolate products, none of which provide him with any pleasure or basically any taste sensations at all. Um, so he realizes obviously something has happened, probably to do with the car accident. So he goes back to the hospital and he gets deep brain scans done. And, and um, on further inspection, it's discovered that there was you know, one piece of damage done by the car accident, and that is that his his Godiva gland was damaged. And as you all know from doing, I presume, middle school biology, right, the, the Godiva gland, I mean, uh, this isn't gonna be one of those occasions when I sort of lament the state of American education mm -hmm. that, that you, you never even learned about the Godiva gland in, in school. Oh, this is just terrible. But um, his Godiva gland, which as you should know, if you don't, is the gland that secretes cocomone, which of course, you know, is the hormone that's uh, responsible for uh, enjoying the taste of chocolate. Um, and so he no longer secretes cocomone, which is why he can't enjoy the taste. Everything else is fine, but chocolate, he just, he just can't experience the taste. There's no pleasure. Um, and it turns out, unfortunately, that human beings are the only creatures who naturally secrete cocomone. And um, we have not yet got to the stage where we round up immigrants at the border and use them to extract cocomone. Maybe during the next Trump presidency, that's what will happen. But, um, oh, I'm, shit, I'm in Indiana. I can't say things like that in this state, can I? I'll probably get deported. It's fine. I mean, you have to say things like that in Colorado. It's required, but- um, In Boulder. In Boulder, yes. Oh, outside Boulder. Oh, Denver, Colorado. I mean, it's only Colorado Springs where, and basically, <laughs> We, we built a wall around Colorado Springs <laughs> and we made them pay for it. <laughs> That's great. But anyway, so um, there's no commercially available sources of Kokomo. Uh, so it's tragic. And then he discovers by chance um, that, uh, in fact, puppies who don't normally secrete Kokomo can be stimulated to secrete it by severe abuse. Um, it turns out that, you know, the 
abused puppies were autopsied and, and this surprising discovery was made. So you can severely abuse puppies and, and kill them pretty nastily. And then you can extract Kokomon from their brains. Well, you know, so Fred thinks, yeah, well, okay. Um, nobody's doing that commercially, but so he decides he's going to do it. So he sets up a Kokomon collection laboratory in his basement. Um, he's got about 26 puppies from newborns to 26 weeks old. Each one, when slaughtered, provides about a week's worth of Kokomon for him. Um, and eventually his neighbors tell on him because they hear the, you know, the, the piteous whimpering uh, from the basement and the police are called. He's arrested for child abuse, um, uh, child. Uh, I think there's no difference, but he's arrested for animal abuse. And on trial, he explains that, of course, he shouldn't be convicted because he's not torturing the puppies in order to, you know, just for sadistic reasons. That's not why he's doing it. Um, in fact, um, he would much rather that the puppies didn't have to suffer, but this is the only way he can get his Kokomon, and that's the only way he can enjoy chocolate. And after all, it's human pleasure we're talking about, and he's a human being, and they are non-human. And so, of course, you know, he's going to be acquitted. Well, you know, obviously he's not. Um, the jury does not buy this story, and and neither should we. Um, so um, the idea of the story is to appeal. Now, meta ethical aside, um, I think the modern way of doing moral philosophy by talking about hypothetical examples is, is is pretty useless. But the one use for it is to act as a consistency test. So um, I don't think you can construct ethical theory by appealing to hypothetical examples. So I think our intuition is a pretty crappy. I'll go into that a bit later. But but it, but for somebody who buys into the intuition bashing method, which is almost all of my fellow ethicists working these days, then um, appealing to an example which they have a particular um, view about and then asking them to, to uh, square that view with other views, I think is fair game. So the point of the example, obviously, uh, is not to convince you that you shouldn't torture puppies because I presume I don't need to convince you of that, um, but it's to draw an analogy with the way that not just millions, but literally billions of animals in this country alone are raised and treated in order for us to eat them. More than eight, uh, 8 billion broiler chickens, maybe approximately 10 billion chickens a year. That's the, by far the largest numbers are raised in factory farmed conditions cramped conditions, uh, unanesthetized mutilations of practice on them, and they're killed pretty savagely. There's a Federal Humane Slaughter Act, which you may have heard of, doesn't apply to chickens, doesn't apply to poultry, because apparently they're not animals, or maybe the chicken industry had some lobbying power. I don't know which could it be. But um, so, in fact, there are no, no laws about how you can slaughter chickens uh, in this country. Um, so, um, What's the point of all this? Well, the point of all this is to say, well, look, um, if you think that what Fred does is morally indefensible, if torturing the puppies just so he can enjoy the taste of chocolate is morally indefensible, then you should think the same thing about purchasing and consuming animals that were raised in conditions that are similar in brutality. And that's the vast majority of animals that are consumed in this country, the vast majority. And so to the extent that you do that, your moral, your behavior is morally on a par with Fred. That's the claim. Now, of course, you know, as philosophers, there's a couple of things we could do in response to this argument, right? I mean, if you want to engage with it as opposed to just sort of dismiss it. Um, so one thing we can do, of course, to maintain consistency in our views is to say, oh, well, I guess it is okay to talk to puppies after all. Um, I had a couple of Texans uh, claim to believe that, um, but I, I don't believe them when they say they believed it. Um, but, you know, there may be some um, so who really believe that. So that's one way to, to maintain consistency. Another way to maintain consistency, which, of course, is what I'm hoping that people, when confronted with this argument, will do, is say, well, yes, you're, you're right. I need to stop purchasing and consuming animal products. Um, 
uh, I mean, in particular, ones raised on factory farms, although you know, for other reasons, this the argument applies in general to so-called humane farming as well. But um, so that's that's the hoped for result. But of course, there's a third way, which is the first thing you'll be thinking of if you agree with me about Fred, but um, also you know want to keep justifying eating animal products, and that's to come up with a morally significant difference between the case of Fred and you. And you can say, well, yes, you're right about Fred, but when I buy chicken in the supermarket and cook and eat it, that's different. It's morally significantly different. It's not just because it's chicken and Fred's doing it to puppets, although some people might try that, but no, they will say it's different. So, in that original article, I went through a few attempts to uh, explain the difference, and most of them are pretty easy to dismiss right away. Right? So, you know, there's, well, Fred tortures the puppies himself, I'm not torturing the chickens, to which we give the Tony Soprano response, you know, which is, okay, well, you know, when Tony Soprano orders, you know, a big pussy to whack Fat Larry or whoever it is, um, then doesn't let Tony Soprano off the hook because he's not doing the whacking himself. And likewise, if Fred were to be squeamish about torturing the puppies and to hire um, who better to do dirty work for very little money, philosophy grad students to do it for him instead. Because as I, as I recall, and as I know from my own grad students, and I suspect from meeting you guys, you know, philosophy grad students will do pretty much anything for money. So, <laughs> um, if Fred were to do that, that wouldn't let Fred off the hook either. So the you know, he does. You know, I don't do it myself. That's not going to wash. Um, there's the well. You know, Fred knows what's going on with the puppies, but I don't know what's going on on factory farms. Well, even if you didn't, you do now because I've just told you. Plus, you do anyway. Don't pretend you don't. Um, and so. The more information is spread about the treatment of animals in intensive farming facilities, the less possibility there is of this, you know, uh, this excuse. Then there's the, you know, the last, uh, um, what is it, the last resort of a scoundrel, which is, of course, the doctrine of double effect. Um, and you can, you can try to claim that the, um, you know, the suffering is intended by Fred, but I don't intend the suffering of the animals on factory farms. Again, that's not going to work. Doctrine double effect is, you know, the intention thing is only one of four clauses. Another one says it could be an outweighing good, no outweighing good. Plus, if we change the example so that Fred had to pour, you know, um, uh, he had to pour like drain cleaner down the throats of the puppies, and it's that what, what stimulates the cocoa production. It's not the actual pain, but that's, you know, it's just going to happen anyway. That, you know, you're not going to change your response with the Fred case. So, so even, I mean, you know, even if you like the doctrine of double effect, and for God's sake, why? But even if you do, then that's not going to help in this case. Um, so there is one difference that I think is worth talking about, and that's basically the main topic of, of this talk. Um, and this is the difference that most critics uh, of, of my article and similar articles making similar points um, have pressed, and that's that's what's often referred to as the causal impotence objection. So let me just let me just uh, sort of get that for you. Um, the way this is often put, you, you might say, "Look, while I agree that Fred's behavior is abominable, my behavior is crucially different. If Fred did not consume his chocolate, he wouldn't raise and torture puppets or pay someone else to do it." Right? So Fred could prevent the suffering of puppets. So if it was up, you know, Fred has the, the it, he has it in his power by his choices to make it the case that the puppies don't suffer. Um, however, if I didn't buy and consume factory raised meat, no animals would be spared lives of misery. Agribusiness is much too large to respond to the behavior of one consumer. Therefore, I cannot prevent the suffering of any animals. So I may well regret the suffering inflicted on animals for the sake of human enjoyment. I may even agree that the human enjoyment doesn't justify the suffering. However, since the animals will suffer no matter what I do, I may as well enjoy the taste of their flesh. Okay, so that's basically the causal limited subjection. Just a, a, a quick aside, um, I, it, it's, not a, it's not absolutely necessary to the argument, 
but I do assume all along that the main, if not the only benefit that Fred gets from torturing the puppies and having the Kokomo is the, the taste experience, the gustatory pleasure. And likewise, that the only benefit that most meat eaters get is the taste. Um, it's not necessary for health. Uh, if your dietitian has told you it is, your dietitian is lying to you. Um, it, you actually will be a lot healthier if you don't eat animal products. I mean, significantly healthier. But um, but uh, even if it were, then you know the the little bit of difference would be vastly outweighed by the suffering of the animals. So so it is important um, to sort of focus on the main probably the only benefit that meat eaters get from eating meat, benefit compared with alternatives, and that's the taste sensation. So they enjoy the taste. That's, in, in terms of anything that could come close to justifying their behavior, it's that. So um, now similar arguments have been made concerning other behavioral choices, such as driving vehicles that emit uh, climate warming gases or voting in large scale elections like presidential elections. So let's see, is this going to actually be done? Here we go. So, so the causal impotence objection is thought to apply to this general class of cases. Like some changes can only be brought about by the collective action of large numbers of people. So if enough people change their behavior, then there may well be a change. But if it's just me, it's just me not taking that Sunday drive. It's just me, you know, continuing uh, or not continuing to eat chicken. If it's just me going into the voting booth, then I can have no effect. I'm causally impotent. So, and here we have the examples. So factory farming is the one I've been talking about. It's, it's my main concern, but I think it's interesting to see how similar um, arguments will apply to other cases. Um, but there's also, of course, climate change. And these usefully hook up, uh, as you may probably know, uh, animal agriculture is the largest single contributor to climate warming emissions. Um, and so um, if, if you're concerned about affecting the climate, uh, then changing your dietary behavior is probably the single most effective thing that any one individual um, without access to like billions of dollars can do. Um, and then of course, there's voting, right? I, I have a colleague at Colorado, Mike Humer, who tries to persuade everyone he can that voting is irrational because there's no chance of making the difference. He also believes that no governments are legitimate and that, you know, so it's, yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so in the, in the voting case, you might think, well, look, what are the chances that I, I can make a difference? And I'm, when I talk about voting a bit later, I'm going to focus on the best case for the, for the skeptic, the voting skeptic, and that is uh, affecting the outcome of a presidential election. But of course, as you know, Americans, when we, we, I got my citizenship in December, so I'm now American, damn it. Um, well, I have two, I have two passports, but um, uh, I, I still, I'm, I'm still contractually obligated to make jokes about the French, you know, that's, because then otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I would have my British citizenship uh, stripped and I want to keep both. Um, so that was the first joke about the French. I'll, I'll see if I can work any more on you. Um, but, um, there's lots of things that we vote for when we vote, right? We don't, I mean, that's one of the confusing things about voting in American elections is you're voting for president, often, you know, like two times out of three, senator, every time congressperson, um, local elections, um, ballot initiatives, you know, whether to legalize weed. Have you guys done that yet? Oh, no. Oh, no, I can just, I, look, we have better, we have better, um, uh, IT, we have better weed yeah. laws. It's like, whoa, yes, it, you're going to be running me out of town, aren't you, for all this gloating? Um, but yeah, uh, we legalized, we in Colorado, we legalized weed and physician assisted suicide in the same, uh, the same election. I thought that was nicely appropriate. Um, so we were the first in the nation to legalize weed. Washington State did it the same election, but we opened dispensaries before they did. So we're number one. Number one. Um, anyway, um, so there's a whole bunch of things. 
Um, and many of these things, you know, statistically speaking, your vote has a much higher chance of affecting the outcome. Presidential, the presidential election is, is like the very best case possible for the voting skeptic. And I'm going to argue later on that even then, uh, even then, there's a very strong case to be made for the rationality of voting. So, um, okay. Now, the causal impotence objection, I've just, that's basically what I just said. So, causal impotence objection to, this is to, um, you know, uh, changing your diet. Same things are supposed to apply to um, uh, climate change behaviors other than changing the diet and to voting. Um, so, What's the standard response to this? Well, the standard response that I gave in the in that article, which Shelley Kagan later produced an entire paper, just sort of basically repeating what I said, but you know that's okay. Uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, I guess. Um, uh, the standard response is just the expected utility response. So, um, and it's you know it roughly just says, look. Um, even if your chances of making a difference are very small, the difference you would make if you made a difference is so significant that you just multiply the probability by the value of the difference and you still get a significant outcome. So I pretended for the sake of argument, I said, look, you know, I mean, um, let's say it takes 10,000 people changing their like, chicken eating behavior for the market to respond. Uh, then you know there's no response unless 10,000 people change their behavior. And this actually can work in either direction. So if more chickens are being bred, then of course what you might have a chance of doing is preventing an increase in chicken production, if it, chicken breeding production. If fewer, then you could have a chance of producing a, a decrease. But either way, um, the, the moral difference would be the same. So if on average, the average chicken eater eats 25 chickens a year. If it takes 10,000 people to change their behavior in order for um, the market to respond, then roughly speaking, when 10,000 chicken eaters, if, if the market's efficient, and we're gonna talk about that, when 10,000 people change their behavior, then uh, like stop eating chicken, then 250,000 fewer chickens would be raised, bred, orchard, slaughtered, brutally and consumed. Um, so one in 10,000 seems like it's a pretty small probability. So I've only got a one in 10,000 chance of making a difference right? on, on the assumption that things just work in like staggered thresholds. And of course, you know, that's a simplifying assumption too. So the, these simplifications are all designed to make the case, the causal impotence case stronger. So once you actually see that these are simplifications, that in fact, um, considerations such as um, uh, if, you, if you give up eating chicken, then that means it'll be shorter time until the next threshold is reached. Then in fact, you see that uh, the argument for you making a difference becomes even stronger. Um, but if we simply multiply 250,000 by one in 10,000, of course we get 25, because you know, that's equivalent to the numbers, number of chickens that you would have consumed otherwise. So um, I say a one in 10,000 chance of making a difference, if, if that's all it is, while it looks to be very small, is still mathematically and morally equivalent to saving 25 chickens. Because if the difference would be 250,000 chickens. So um, that's the response I give in, the, in that original article. And since then, a lot of people have criticized me and Shelley Kagan and other people um, and have claimed that, in fact, I'm oversimplifying the situation with the expected utility response. So, one example involves, um, it comes from John Harris and Richard Galvin, uh, who jointly published um, a response to my original article, in, in which they, among other things, they imagine, they ask you to imagine a particular case. Um, and that's the last chicken sandwich at a Wendy's in Kingman, Arizona at 3 a.m. I have no idea why they picked Kingman, Arizona. 
maybe one of them was in this situation, and it's seconds before closing time. There's one chicken sandwich left. And they say, well, look, you know, perhaps we can know enough about exactly what will happen if we buy the sandwich, right, in this particular place. Well, we really can be certain that they have one the fake production. They say, there's the chicken sandwich. And if you don't eat it, if you don't buy it, it's just going to be thrown away. That's the idea. So what they're claiming then is that sometimes we can know enough about what exactly will happen, right? To reduce our subjective credence in our act of buying, having no effect, to zero. Now, it's really important, and this has become apparent, that we're not just talking about close to zero. We're talking about literally zero. And this would involve knowing not just either that the restaurant would not record a difference in their official report to whomever they report to, although such a report would have, again, literally zero chance of making a difference at any other stage in any causal process that might lead, however indirectly, to differences being made in decisions about animals, numbers of animals to raise, but also we would have to know that our choice of purchasing and consuming this chicken sandwich would have no chance of affecting our own future behavior or that of others in any way that could be part of a causal chain, no matter how indirect to such differences in animal raising decisions. Now, when we add all the specifications to make it plausible that we got confronted with a case where we know with certainty that there's zero chance of our purchasing decision making an effect, Right. Then I say, yeah, in that situation, there would be no animal welfare related reason not to buy the chicken sandwich. Of course, there will be massive aesthetic reasons, and health related reasons, and you know all kinds of other reasons not to buy the chicken sandwich, but mainly, mainly no animal welfare related reasons. But I'm pretty sure I've never been in this situation. Um, and I'm pretty sure that almost nobody else has either, because it's, it's not just a situation where, as a matter of fact, your behavior makes no difference. It's a situation where, as a matter of fact, you are justified in believing that there is zero probability of your behavior making a difference. Zero, not very close to zero, actually zero. Right? Now, so this is one of their examples, but it's not actually their main strategy. Their main strategy you know, is to just stress how unlikely it is that our individual behavior will make a difference. So it's not to say, well, look, there could be cases where it's literally zero, but really just to say, well, yeah, usually it's very, very small. Right? I'll come back to that. Other people have pointed out that my example and Shelley Kagan's similar use of this kind of reasoning assumes a simple linear relationship between demand as measured by consumer consumption and supply as measured by total number of animals of various kinds. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just quote a couple of these um, people to you. Okay, so this is Julia Nevsky. She says, some stores may have more complex ordering strategies in which decisions depend on a variety of factors, including upcoming marketing plans, availability and cost of other products, news about one's competitors, wide range of statistics about past sales. The factory farm most likely jogs along producing as much as it can given the space and resources it has. Right? And there's, there's more, I think there's two more. Um, Gary Chartier writes, it's simply not the case that production levels are functionally related only to or vary directly with purchasing levels. And the scale of the market is only one of the factors that determine production levels. These may include pricing strategies, subsidies, availability of other uses for factory farms, products, creative marketing responses to purchasing reductions, and on and on and on. And lastly, there's Mark Udolson, who's actually written several things on this. Um, the key empirical point is that animal products from factory farms, like many other products we consume, are delivered by a massive and complex supply chain in which there's waste and other forms of inefficiency at each link, where the inefficiency serves as a buffer to absorb any would-be effects from the links before. As a result, it's implausible, he says, that even a lifetime of decisions to consume animal products by a single individual would make a difference to the number of animals produced and harmed over that time. So these are all ways of sort of stressing the complexity of the market uh, uh, in order to persuade you that your individual behavior can't make a difference. But notice none of them, none of these critics is saying the consumer demand is irrelevant to supply, that would be really silly, right? 
but rather they're saying there are other factors which help determine supply in various circumstances. But I presume they would, and I know they do because I put this to them, uh, they would all admit that in some obvious sense, demand is the fundamental factor, at least in anything like a market economy. After all, it doesn't actually matter how many buffers you've got built in to absorb waste or inefficiency or how many limited time price adjustments are being offered or what tax incentives or other legal features in place. If demand is low enough, no factory farm is going to chug along producing as much as it can. So just to meet to illustrate this with a sort of fanciful example, assume otherwise. Right? Picture the annual board of directors meeting at Purdue Farms chicken conglomerate. Okay, so here's Frank Purdue. How many broilers did we produce this year? CFO, Chief Financial Officer, replies, two billion. Same as last year and the year before and the year before. And in fact, every year since we opened our last farm, remember our motto, chug along as usual. <laughs> Frank Purdue. So how was demand this year? How many people ate chicken? And how many of those bought how many of our broilers? CFO replies, well, Frank, demand is down again. It appears that there are now fewer than 1 million chicken eaters in the US. We estimate that about 250,000 of them bought about 10 million of our broilers. We managed to sell over 12 million chickens to supermarkets because of the built-in margins for waste that we encourage them to use. Also, our lobbyists managed to squeeze even more subsidies out of the government. So we've got Uncle Sam to take another 50 million off our hands. Not sure what they do with them. I think they use them as coolants and nuclear reactors. Um, that left us with 1 billion, 938 million broilers that we disposed of in the usual way off the coast of Florida. <laughs> Padu says, hmm, so for next year, what do you say? Shall we chug along as usual? Another two billion? CFO replies, yes, that seems right to me. As I learned in business school, the surest way to success in a market-based economy is to pay no attention whatsoever to consumer behavior. <laughs> now, okay, that, that was absurd. That's why I like it, but that was absurd. But there's an important point to bear in mind which is that consumer behavior in the form of demand is clearly irrelevant to supply. And ultimately, it's more important than any other factor in anything like a market economy. Granted, say the critics, but we don't live in a world in which demand for chicken in the US is down to just a few million a year. In our world, in the US, over 8 billion broiler chickens are raised each year on factory farms and most of them are eventually sold and eaten. In this world, you can't just take the number of chickens produced, divide it by the number of chicken consumers to get the expected utility of one consumer's change in behavior and making a difference. Of course, there will still be thresholds. There would have to be. Otherwise, we could find ourselves in the absurd situation of that example. At some point, you know, you can't just keep saying, well, it would make a difference of 10,000 and then another 10, another 10, another 10. And then you get down to 1 million left and Purdue Farms throwing away nearly 2 billion chickens. Of course, there's got to be thresholds. The thresholds themselves might be vague, of course, but they won't affect expected utility calculations. What might affect them is the fact that other factors may well prevent the response to demand from being linear. Perhaps when 10,000 fewer chicken eaters um, purchase a quarter of a million fewer chickens, a large part of the slack will be taken up by these other factors. So production won't adjust at that point. But after even more consumers change their behavior, maybe it will, perhaps it'll take 20 or 30,000 people changing their behavior to bring about a production adjustment equivalent to the consumption of only 10,000. Or maybe, though this seems pretty unlikely, even 40 or 50,000 people would have to consume um, fewer chickens. in order to produce a reduction in, of just a quarter of a million chickens. So, you know, maybe 1.25 million fewer chickens purchased would only produce a reduction in supply of a quarter of a million. Um, and that would render the expected reduction in chicken breeding of each foregone chicken life as one fifth of a chicken. Of course, if that happens, there'll be less room for slack in the subsequent arrangement, suggesting that the next threshold will take 
fewer changes in behavior to reach, but perhaps still more than the subsequent adjustment would take into account and so on. So what's the relevance of these considerations to expected utility calculations? Now, remember what I said in my original argument is that if we know with certainty, real certainty, not just a very high degree of probability that there won't be a change in behavior big enough to precipitate either a decrease or increase in animal production, then the expected utility in terms of animal welfare of changing our diets is zero. But of course, we don't know that. In fact, it's easy to see both that the numbers of animals raised for food does in fact vary from year to year, and that the numbers of most animals raised for food, including chickens, is on a diminishing trend compared with the total population. And surveys suggest that the increases in total meat consumption as opposed to per capita consumption are mostly driven by immigrants from other countries where meat is more expensive, who at least in the short term increase their consumption of meat, but we don't yet know what the long-term trend is. Perhaps we can know with certainty that there will never be enough changes in behavior to produce a counterfactual difference in animal rearing corresponding to the number of animals no longer consumed. So perhaps we can know that the expected utility of me giving up eating one chicken is one chicken, say, right? That it could never be, it, that it will never be one to one, perhaps. I don't think we can know that, right? Um, but so what, right? What is that bit? That bit. Right. So perhaps we can know it'll never be one to one, right? But the story doesn't end there, right? So first of all, there's considerable evidence that markets are becoming more efficient, not less. And that's mostly due to sophisticated mechanisms for tracking and analyzing consumer behavior. So most of us pay for purchases with credit cards, which are tracked by sophisticated computer programs. My consumer behavior is analyzed and used to tailor advertising on my computer directly to me. Mostly I see advertisements for cameras and lenses because that's what I like. Um, I've stopped being surprised. I said, oh, wow, that's a coincidence. I was just, I was just thinking about that new lens that Canon has released. And that's, a, oh, okay, no, not a coincidence. Okay. So now I remember when my wife first expressed puzzlement that the coupon book from our local supermarket, this was about 15 years ago, contained almost exclusively coupons for products we already used. When we first moved to Boulder, we used to get coupon books uh, every week from our local supermarket, which was it's called King Supers. It's actually, it, it, it was the site of a horrific mass shooting uh, a few years ago. It's like a quarter of a mile from my house, um, but um, it's owned by Kroger's. And, so we used to get these coupon books. The vast majority of the coupons were completely useless to us. They were products that we would never in a million years buy. And then it changed. And, you know, 50, 60, 70% of the coupons were actually for things that we either already bought or we were quite interested in. And, you know, Anna said, that's not a coincidence. And... Of course, what had happened was that they just changed their software system, they were tracking purchases, and they were custom printing computer books tailored to different customers. Now, of course, it, they email us, uh, so we don't get, thank goodness, more trees killed, but still, it's even more tailored to what we like. So, Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, so the more sophisticated the market gets at tracking our behavior, the more likely it is, the bigger the chance that our the changes in our behavior will actually have an effect. So it's it I mean, of course it's not that it would ever be the one-to-one, -one, but it just becomes um, that much, I mean, thresholds are likely to become smaller and smaller. That's the point. Um, but of course, there are, you know, other considerations that count in favor of giving up eating meat. So, 
health benefits to the consumer as one, as I already mentioned. Um, your chances, your, your risk of most forms of heart disease, most forms of cancer, type two diabetes uh, go down way, way, way when you cut out animal products. They, they go down when you cut out meat, but they get down even more when you cut out all animal products. Eggs and dairy get pretty damn bad for you too. Um, yeah, that's a very depressing thing to hear. I, I think, but, you, know, you probably know it already, and if you didn't, now you do. So, sorry. Um, okay. Um, but also, think about what the situation would be if, in fact, the, the expected utility was nothing like one-to-one. -one, right? What if it were, oh, I don't know. Mm, what if it were, ooh, what's two days? Two days, yeah. Suppose that there are no health benefits to giving up eating meat. Suppose that in fact, you get no pleasure whatsoever from eating non-animal alternatives. And so giving up eating meat, what, you, what it would cost you is the entire gustatory experience, as opposed to just the comparison between that and what you would have had from eating something different. Now, of course, this isn't true of anybody, but just suppose it were. Suppose that the only food that would give you any pleasure is animal-based. And let's say it's, you know, it's beef or chicken or something like that. And, you know, let's say that, um, oh, I don't know, how long does a commercial boiler live? About six weeks, right? About 42 days. And so let's, let's give like 10 kinds of credence that it's worth to the critics and say, yeah, what if the expected utility were a 20th? It's not one chicken, it's not half a chicken, it's not a fifth of a chicken, it's a 20th of a chicken. The markets are so inefficient that it's going to take, you know, um, do the math, 200,000 people giving up eating chicken for a reduction in, in production of equivalent to 10,000. So if you give up eating chicken, the expected benefit is 1 20th of the tortured life of one chicken, right? So now, what would it take for your behavior to be justified? Again, making all these assumptions, none of which is actually justified. I'm giving far too much credit to the critic here. What would it take? You get no pleasure from any other kind of food. So you're giving up the entire chicken pleasure. And there's no difference in health outcome. So none of that. And it's only 120th of expected utility of giving up a chicken. Well, a 20th of the life of a chicken is about two days. Broiler chicken lives for about 42 days. So you would have to say that the pleasure you get from eating that chicken, even under these assumptions that are friendly to the meat-eating critic, the pleasure you get from eating one chicken is more significant, is greater than two days of a miserable, tortured life of a chicken on a factory farm. So think about that. I just, just take a minute to think about what it would take to say that sincerely. My pleasure, my human pleasure is so important that the pleasure I get from eating this chicken is more important than 48 hours of the horrible, miserable, tortured existence of a chicken on a factory farm. What kind of moral monster could actually maintain that? None of you is a moral monster, but none of you believes that. I'm told that, it, that people will live up to your expectations. So you tell them stuff and then <laughs> yeah. it worked with my son. I said, you will be six feet, four inches tall. So. <laughs> and, and now he is. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, and it was just because I told him that. <laughs> I, mean, I, I assume. 
Um, so given what we know about the ways the markets work and especially about the ways in which sophisticated technology is getting increasingly good at tracking, analyzing our behavior, I suspect that we are actually epistemically justified in assigning something pretty close to the expected utility values that I suggested in my original article. There's a, a book called Compassion by the Pound where they do a bunch of uh, calculations and they estimate something like 0.76, you know, for each pound of chicken you give up, you can estimate like 0.76 pounds of chicken suffering, say. Um, they actually, I don't know, you know, they analyze markets and stuff. They do what those economist boffin types do. Um, but even if we think, even if we say, okay, we're gonna give the best possible case to the critic of my argument. You would, we, we would have to be moral monsters to think that our net credential benefits would outweigh even the much smaller expected harms that the outputs of the inefficient mechanisms. So given, okay, well, this is just, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, I was, I was going to put Sam Bankman feed up there. And <laughs> could be quite fast. Um, so why? Why do people still push this causal impotence objection? And given the overwhelming case against it, why does people still push it? Well, for some, I think it's a desperate desire to justify their continuing to eat meat, despite decisive reasons not to. And it's understandable. <laughs> I'm sure there are beliefs of mine that I irrationally cling on to for similar reasons. Um, but others who already agree that we shouldn't eat meat. So Galvin and Harris, for example, the ones who came up with the Kingman Arizona example, um, they're vegans, right? But so, so why do they push the causal limit of subjection? Well, it's an even more desperate desire to, we go, to reject consequentialism. Right. Um, so just remember the absurd lengths that this desire drives Philip afoot to, right? In uh, whichever that famous uh, dot and double effect is, it, is that the one, right? She thought is prepared to assert that there is no sense in which it's all things considered overall better that only one person dies than that millions of others die, not just millions, trillions, all the sentient beings in the universe. She asserts that there is just no, she can make no sense of all things considered better judgments. And she admirably is upfront about why she's doing this in the very beginning of that article, right? It's because if you don't do this, she thinks you'll have to be a consequentialist. Uh, she hates consequentialism so much that she's just gonna say the most absurd things, right? So, that is my high, you know, one hypothesis about why people push the causal impotence objection is they, they think, okay, well, obviously there are decisive objections against eating meat, but if the causal impotence objection works, then a consequentialist can't explain that. So, aha, I got you. You are miserable utilitarian now. All right. That's why, right? Oh. Here's another. Another reason why, and this goes back to what I said about there being a crucial difference between zero and close to zero. All right? It's one thing to say, look, it's really unlikely our behavior will make a difference. It's another thing to say there's, it's, there's no chance, literally zero chance our behavior will make a difference. We are very bad at responding to big numbers. So here's one of my favorite examples. You probably, a lot of you have probably heard this already. So take a piece of uh, a standard printer paper, right? That's, that, you, that comes in a pack, but it's like two inches thick. You get five hundred sheets of paper in a two-inch thick pack. You know, uh, every varsity department has their own shelves that you use in the printers. For those of you who are moral monsters enough to still print things out and not <laughs> care about future generations, so I'm, 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 it's obvious by now that I like lots of moral monsters. Big trips. It's often fun, nice and easily. Um, so a standard sheet of a letter-sized printer paper that 500 in, in two inches, it's something like half a millimeter thick, something like that. Now imagine folding that in half, 
right? So that's one fold. And you think about how thick that is. So now imagine folding it in a half a second close. And now think about how thick that is. So now imagine doing that if you could, I think it would be physically impossible, but if you could do that 42 times, right? So one fold, two folds, three folds, four folds, and so on, 42 times. So when you ask people how thick the resulting piece of paper would be, and I've done this with many, many introductory level classes, and I just ask people to guess. Has anyone heard this example before? So some of you probably, you, you've heard the example before. So somebody who hasn't heard the example before, I mean, just guess. A mile. A mile. How thick would it be if you fold it 42 times? A mile, that's one possibility. That seems pretty damn long. I mean, I, that's actually the longest estimate that I've heard is, is a mile. Most students will say, oh, I don't know, five inches. And sometimes they'll say 100 yards and they'll laugh. Like the length of a football, American football field, not counting the end zones. And they'll laugh because they'll think, you know, I say, when did you say that? And they'll say, oh, it was probably going to be surprisingly big. So I just went, I just went for something certainly big. And what else? All the way to the moon. All the way to the moon. Exactly. <laughs> Over 400,000 kilometers. All the way to the moon. So, how many of you are surprised to hear that? Yeah, of course you are. I mean, I'm, I was very surprised when I thought, of course, it's surprising. But it's just math. <laughs> you know, you just keep doubling half a millimeter and you get there. I mean, it's, you know, any of you can do it if you're with a pencil and paper or a calculator or whatever. Human beings are terrible with big numbers. Absolutely terrible. There, there's a, like a cottage industry of, well, they used to be, they stopped writing about it recently, but like philosophers who'd write about these thought experiments. Oh, imagine if the universe went on for an infinite length of time. And, you know, in universe A, there was somebody who had five hedons a day. And in universe B, there was someone who had 10 hedons a day. And wouldn't universe B be better than universe A? But, ooh, look, you, you aggregative utilitarians, you've got to say they're the same. So <laughs> aren't you silly? So, what? You, you're trusting any intuitive reaction you have to a thought experiment involving infinitely long lives? Come on. We are awful, awful with big numbers. So here, here's another example of how terrible we are with big numbers. So the Large Hadron Collider. Remember the Large Hadron Collider and so on? Right? This thing where they smash atoms together. It, it, it sounds more exciting than it is. I don't know if you've seen smashing it. But anyway, so the Large Hadron Collider and so on, when, when they were um, about to, you know, start it going, there was a story that went around the internet. They were these worries that activating the Large Hadron Collider would lead to catastrophic results. I want to remember why, you know, what was, what was the worry? I mean, it, what they, it wasn't just being made up. It was based in something real. I want to remember why that's the Large Hadron Collider. I think I'm told it is, yes. Weren't they trying to fix something in terms of open a black hole or something? Yes, yes. I'm going to open a black hole, but just create, I, mean, I think they call them strangers. Um, yeah, apparently with these atom smashes, they do in fact create tiny black holes, but they, they, they exist for like a, a nanosecond. I mean, so that's actually what happens with these, these you know, particle colliders. But the worry was that instead of these miniature black holes sort of coming into and out of existence really quickly, you know, some of them would sort of clump together and, 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 and sort of become stable. And then, of course, you know, if there's an actual black hole that's existing more than a nanosecond, what happens? Well, we all get sucked into it. Um, and, you know, the solar system, all kinds of stuff. I don't know. I mean, it's like, you know, dogs and cats living together, all kinds of, all kinds of, of outrageous things are going to happen. And so there was a lot of chatter about this at the time, right? a lot of chatter about this. Will it, will it you know, will, um, will activating the Large Hadron Collider lead to the end of the world? And, you know, some people were saying, yes, yes, so we must do it, we must do it. Um, I, wa I was watching, I don't know, I think it was PBS probably. Uh, I was watching a professional physicist, that is someone who is paid to do physics. I mean, you probably know them. They exist in this university. They exist in my university. 
um, I, they, they, they're in, what do they call it? The physics department, that way. Um, and they have like PhDs in what is it? physics, that's it. Um, so this professional physicist from a, and it, it was a, it was a, from a respectable university. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a Mickey Mouse school, like, I don't know, Harvard or Princeton. It was a respectable university. Um, and he was being interviewed and he was being asked. He said, well, you know, what about this Larry that's, that, that starting the Large Hadron Collider will lead to the disastrous facts in the world? Gaps and dogs, all that kind of stuff. And, and he said, well, look, you know, it's, we don't need to be worried. The interviewer said, well, why don't we need to be worried? Well, look, the chances of that happening are really small. Now, if you were an interviewer in that situation, what would be your follow-up question? How small? Of course. And to his credit, that's what the interviewer said. How small? Right? Because it's, it's kind of important. You know, is it like rolling a dime? Passing a coin? How small? So this is what he said. The chances, they're no more than about one in 10 million. So at that point, and I'm not making this up, I fell off my chair. I literally fell off my chair. I'm not using literally in the metaphorical sense that's often used. I literally, literally fell off my chair. And what did I think to myself? Don't they teach arithmetic in physics grad school these days? And the next thought was, I'm going to write to this guy's department and demand that he be fired, and then write to where he's got his PhD and demand that they take it away. Um, so one in 10 million, yeah, that's really small. But, but think about it. It's a small chance, but what is it a small chance of? <laughs> right? <laughs> The destruction of the entire planet. More than 7 billion, and that was a, then, it's like 8 billion now, more than 7 billion human beings. Many billions of trillions more of other sentient beings. All the future beings that could have been, would have existed, but won't. And so that's a lot, right? <laughs> that's a big, big thing that was being prevented. So consider... Uh, Sorry, a uh, picture. Yeah, yeah, it's Brian Cox. Not that Brian Cox, it's another Brian Cox. Yes, they, they often get confused on British TV because there's, there's Brian Cox from Succession, wonderful actor, and this Brian Cox, who's a, you know, one of the popularizers of physics. And, uh, he's, a, he's a charismatic kind of guy. And um, so, anyway, yes, um, that's what he said at the time, right? Um, Less than one in 50 million. That's a bit better than one in 10 million, but still, still would make me a bit nervous. I mean, less than one in 50 million, sure, but that, you know, if you have to put, if you have to say 50 million or less than, that probably means that you're not confident that it's less than 100, one in 100 million. So you still might be pretty nervous. So that was the guy. Yeah, that was the guy who said that. So just assume that. All that is at stake is 7 billion humans. So as it was at the time he said, it was like 10, 15 years. 7 billion humans. So let's say that's all that's at stake, 7 billion humans. 1 in 10 million, 7 billion, that's 700, right? 1 in 10 million, that's why they 7 billion, that's 700. So imagine now that instead of this chance, we were told, yeah, here's the thing about this little village in Switzerland. There's, there's all these cute villagers wearing their later hose and then and playing their, their, you know, whatever those things, those flugel forms or flugel forms or whatever, and they're, they're sucking their, their throat lozenges. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 and probably, um, what else are there in Switzerland? Oh, yeah, they're profiting off Nazi gold. Yes. So, um, um, but no, don't say that. No, you take that bit back because then you're not going to feel sympathetic for the next bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and 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 there's there's no way to get them out of there. And if you press the button, then it'll kill seven hundred of them, right? How many people would say, "Oh yeah, yeah, go ahead, it's just seven hundred Swiss villages"? Uh, so it'll be outrageous, right? But one in ten million times seven billion, seven hundred, right? So, of course, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about 
We're not talking about the end of the world. But, you know, billions of animals, that's a lot, so factory farming. Global warming, who knows how much, you know, how big effect that's going to be. I mean, you don't know, but it's looking pretty bad. Um, I mean, there's an upside, you know. Mar a Lago will probably be submerged, but that's maybe the only upside. <laughs> um, so, it's fine to say, look, the chances are very, very small, but to dismiss arguments based on small chances without looking at the other side of the equation, what are the small chances of, is morally and mathematically irresponsible. You don't have to be a utilitarian, but well, you do, sorry. But I mean, you don't have to be a utilitarian in order to care about the relationship between probabilities on the one hand and what their probabilities are on the other. You just have to be a normal, rational, decent human being. Like, there's a huge difference between like <laughs> getting into your car and thinking, yeah, well, you know. Statistically speaking, there's a one in like 500,000 chance that I'll get into an accident because that's, you know, what careful drivers do. Getting into your car thinking, well, I've had a few drinks, so statistically speaking, there's a one in 10 chance of getting into an accident. If you ignore the probabilities, you're not being responsible. So, the last thing I want to talk about, it's not a bit like, okay, but I'll do this quickly. The last thing I want to talk about is voting, right? So, voting. Oh, yeah, but regarding the Hegel Collider, it, it turns out that the guy was wrong. <laughs> um, I mean, I've spoken to other physicists and they said, yeah, yeah, you, the actual chances are so sort of unquantifiably small. He just said that because he thought that people needed to hear something. Uh, he, want, he didn't want to say there's zero because that would be, he thought that would be morally responsible. And so he just grasped for a number that he thought was so small that it would, that it would you know, reassure people. He, not thinking that some of us can do basic arithmetic. Um, so anyway, uh, yes, yes. So to, don't, don't worry about the Hegel play. Yeah. I'm, I'm told, if I get you worried about that, don't worry about the Hegel play. But what about presidential elections, right? So you might think, okay, that's another example, voting where it takes lots and lots of people to, to make a difference. Why should I vote if my chance of making a difference is tiny? So this, this was done, oh, I don't know, a few years back. Um, between one in a million and one in a hundred, one, so one in 10 million, one in a hundred million, you know, average chance of affecting the presidential election, just the presidential election, right? So, okay, let's say it's really small. Let's say it's one in 10 million. You know, there are some states where, in, in fact, given what we know about what happened in 2016 and 2020, there are probably quite a few states where it's a lot bigger than the 2020 election. A lot bigger than the one in 10. Um, what difference does the president make? Well, I'm going to talk about the 2000 election, which only the old people here remember. <laughs> uh, I remember it vividly. All right. So, one estimate said the, the Result of invading Iraq, as opposed to not invading Iraq, was at least half a million more Iraqis and others killed. Right? It was done with a pretty sophisticated analysis of differential death rates. Um, and these numbers are pretty accurate. Probably, you know, that's a very conservative estimate. What difference did it make that we invaded Iraq? Um, at least half a million more deaths, right? Come to that one. Um, but let's say it was just half a million. Let's say that. In fact, in 2000, that's the only thing at stake. Invading Iraq, not invading Iraq. And by the way, I was living in Texas in 2000. George W. Bush was governor of Texas. We knew that he was going to invade Iraq. This wasn't like, oh, this is so surprising. He made it absolutely clear. At any excuse, he would invade Iraq. He, he blamed Saddam Hussein for plotting against his dad. Right, so this, it wasn't like all oh, this came out of the blue. Yeah, we knew that George W. Bush would do this. We also knew that Al Gore wouldn't do this. Right? Um, I mean, unless Saddam was saying actually launched nuclear weapons, which he didn't have. Um, yeah, we knew. And, and Al Gore, you know, let's say that 9 11 actually happened on Al Gore's watch. Who knows whether it would have done? Al Gore probably wouldn't have ignored all the warnings from the Clinton administration. Uh, probably wouldn't. Um, so, 
And let's just say then that the difference it made in 2000, the difference that the Bush versus Gore made was half a million human lives. And let's say you're in a state where you have a one in 10 million chance of affecting death. So pretty damn small. Well, that's a 20th of a human life. Right? One in 10 million times half a million. So um, imagine, right? You're visiting your sweet old grandma. And she's 76. Oops. And she's just been diagnosed with a disease which will kill her unless she takes a certain medication within the next two or three hours. And the medication will prolong her life at a good quality for another four years. And it's also available free of charge at the local pharmacy. And unfortunately, she's bedridden temporarily because of the disease and can't make the trip to the pharmacy, which is just four blocks from the house. So she asks you to go and pick up the medication for her. But she warns you, you might have to stand in line for, you know, half an hour or so. And then you'd rather stay there watching TV. So you consider whether it's really worth it for you to go four blocks out of your way and wait in line for 30 minutes or even a bit more just to provide granny with an extra four years of life. <sighs> That'd be a 20th of her total life. She's 76 now, four years. Just you. you think about it and you say, <clears throat> fuck that granny. <laughs> it's too much trouble. Now notice, this example gives the best case for the opponents of voting. As I already said, in fact, in elections, it's more than just the presidential election. In fact, there's often more than just, you know, and there's often a lot more that, at stake than there was even in 2000. Think about the millions of women whose reproductive rights have been denied because of what happened in 2016. Think about the thousands of women in Texas so far who've been forced to carry their rapist baby to term. That's just in Texas because of what happened in 2016. That's just a start. So here's another thing. I don't know about you, but I enjoy voting. So it's actually not a cost. Plus, in many states, including mine, you can vote by mail. I, they, they send me the ballot. And I get to sit down at a table and discuss with my wife and say, oh, what should we vote for on the, you know, kill all old people uh, ballot measure? <laughs> oh, no, we're going to vote against that. How about the kill all young people? Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll vote for that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people enjoy voting. So it's not even as if there's a cost, a net cost for many people to vote. But even if there was, even if there was a net cost, even if that net cost was like the trouble of standing in line for half an hour, walking four blocks. And all that was at stake was what was at stake in the 2000 election. Right. Even so, for you to say, well, yeah, Granny's last four years are just not worth the trouble, right? Clearly, right? If you don't bother to bubble, you obviously hate your sweet old grandma, right? Mm -hmm. So the takeaway, right, in case in case I haven't hit you over the head enough with it, here's the takeaway. Vote. You miserable bastards, vote. And for the sake of all that's good and decent, or at least not totally sucky, vote for the lesser of two evils. Don't throw your vote away helping to saddle us all with a monster. Otherwise, you, all of you, will discover that like Lady Macbeth and millions of Nader, Stein, and Johnson voters, the blood that's on your hands will never wash away. Thank you. Register the vote. <laughs> and you have three minutes to do it, <laughs> and we will reconvene for a uh, question and answer.
Okay, so we're going to get started with the discussion. Um, I've been told that the reception is going to be somewhere that way. Uh, so, the, so, so if you head that way, uh, there should be something to eat and something to drink. I'm glad to see um, that it's, you, you're as organized with receptions as you are with technology. <laughs> uh, so we started a little bit late today because of the technological difficulties. We're going to go till 6.10 for the Q&A. If anybody needs to leave, I, you know, I understand. Please leave quietly if you need to leave at 6. Um, following our usual procedure, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Please keep them up. I'm going to try to keep a cue. As we go along, please, if you, if, you, if you have a question that comes to you later, please try to catch my eye. I will put you in the queue. If I don't know your name, I apologize. If I'm having a senior moment and just can't remember your name, I apologize. Um, I just think the same. If, I'm if, I'm, if I'm having one of my moments uh, and I can't yeah. remember your name, I apologize. Um, is there anything else that I need to say? I, oh, yes. And if you have a follow up and it's a real follow up, you can sig signal that with raising a finger. Okay, so um, we're going to start with James. And please, everybody else, please keep your hands up. Okay, so I have a question that's really about expected utility about like why we should care about this in this case. And it may just reveal a uh, lack of mathematical knowledge, but I'm going to go for the question anyway, just to see what you say. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like uh, what we really care about is okay, let's, let's use concrete numbers, some of this. Like, let's say we have a one in a thousand shot of being responsible for 250,000 animal deaths because of we didn't contribute. Okay. Um, so we're responsible. Mm -hmm. It seems like what we would really care about is like, whether that can happen. Like it's a one in a thousand shot. What if somebody's just like, I'm just gonna take the bet. Mm -hmm. So like in the long run, over many, 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 many lifetimes, eventually you're gonna lose the bet and you're gonna be responsible for 250,000 animal deaths. But we all only have one lifetime. And so it seems like you care about expected value more with like many, many trials where eventually you're gonna lose. Um, and it's a way of figuring out like the cost of when you do lose, this is like the, the cost of the bet every time. But um, it seems like you might just think, well, it's a one in a thousand shot. I've got a 999 chance of not having a very bad thing happening. I only have one lifetime. I'm just going to take the bet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to respond to that because I, I, I guess I, I, I could sort of give you uh, examples from, you know, ordinary situations where we, in general, we, but by we, I mean like the public in general is sort of outraged at people taking chances that are smaller than that. You see, I mean, if, uh, uh, I don't know, um, a baby is left in a hot car um, and, uh, uh, or, you know, parents driving with a baby, not in a car seat, sort of bouncing around in the back seat. I mean, objectively, there might be less than 1,000 chance of that thing happen. But uh, typically, I mean, the normal response to that is that's that's completely irresponsible. And if the parent says, well, yeah, I, you know, I was willing to take my lips if the baby died, but I, you know, because it didn't, I'm fine, you know, no criticism of me. Um, so, uh, you know, airline safety measures. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I do think that you know we can go over the top uh, for some of these. Um, but you know, let's say you know, um, let's say uh, tests revealed that uh, Delta Airlines had been flying, you know, a whole fleet of airplanes without working oxygen masks or um, exits, uh, safety exits for like a week. Um, and you know, do the math. What are the chances that that would actually hurt anybody? Tiny. But again, we'd be outraged uh, if, if, if we hear about that. I mean, I, I guess I think that, um, you know, ordinary human life is full of negotiating uncertainty and risk. And that um, we, you know, the normal thing to do is to attempt something 
you know, roughly speaking, like an expected utility calculation. Obviously, the what goes in the utility side is going to vary according to your axiology. I mean, so if you're a hedonist and utilitarian, it's all about pleasure and pain. If you're, you know, I mean, other kinds of axiologies might say, well, you know, what are the chances of spreading falsehoods or, you know, or, um, you know, lack of integrity or something like that. Um, but, uh, but still, the, you know, that I risk this bad thing happening, I think is, is uh, it, I mean, if somebody says, well, why should I care about risking bad things happening? I should only care about bad things happening. But I think the way to care about bad things happening is to care about risk because, I mean, there's almost no certainty in, in any choice. Uh, if I, you know, pointed a gun at your head, or loaded gun and pulled the trigger, I wouldn't be certain that you would die. Fire and hit me or something. I don't know. I mean, they, uh, isn't there that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? All the particles in my body could simultaneously jump to the left. I don't know. So it's not 100% certain. So I, I think that um, there, there's no principled way of sort of going down a diminishing line of smaller and smaller probabilities and say, well, at this point, it doesn't matter. I mean, if it, if it matters whether it's 99% likely and then 98, 97, 96, and so on. At which, at which point do we say, well, yeah, it really mattered if it was, you know, I had a 10% chance of killing my kid, but 9% chance, that's fine. I'll take that. I mean, yeah. So I, it's probably not very satisfactory. I just, uh, I, I'm not sure what else I can say to, to motivate you to please care about risk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not satisfactory. Well, okay, okay. Right. David Sussman? Yeah. Sorry, I just want to pick up on James's question quickly. First, um, I don't think anyone, well, I will speak for David, um, is saying don't care about risk. Um, the claim here is whether, as a word, something like expected utility reasoning is indeed the rational standard here. Mm -hmm. So that, and it isn't the case, for example, that if a, a risk gets sufficiently small, it can be written off altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, the utility is made too well if 99%, obviously, 50%. If I can't identify, I mean, that, that's sorority reasoning. Yes, and, but well, yeah. but not all sorority reasoning is fallacious. That's like calling something a slippery slope and assuming that that's a bad thing. Some slippery slope arguments are really good. Don't press the nuclear button because, you know, there's a nuclear chain reaction which you can't stop. Well, okay. Well, it seems to me it would be you need to say something about why, if you want to make that argument, why this sort of sorority reasoning is more respectable than I guess my, and I, I hope this is has something to do with James' question, though, is, I mean, this is you committed to the position that I should be indifferent between these two choices. Um, 100% chance of saving one, one person's life, currently, mm -hmm. and a one in a billion chance of saving a billion lives. Mm -hmm. I, I can flip a coin between those. I mean, in terms of, I think, of expected utility, yeah. those are equal. In terms of expected utility, those are equal. In terms of, um, in terms of whether we should encourage that kind of reasoning, you know, um, there are lots of things to say at that point, such as, yeah, I mean, when we get to chances like one in a billion, um, none of us has ever been justified in, in putting a probability as precise as one in a billion combined with saving a billion lives, a lot of us might well have been in position to save one life. Uh, in fact, we are in that position you know, all the time when deciding whether to give to certain family efficient charities. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, again, this is one of those cases where um, it's typical in, in moral philosophy, as you know, to say, well, look, this view is committed to the view that this thing and this thing are morally equivalent or, or morally different, it depends on what uh, what view you're, you're, you're taking. And, and then, of course, the point of saying that is to appeal to our intuitions that they are either you know different or in fact similar, contrary to what the theory says. Um, but once we get to cases where we compare something which is not that hard to imagine, like you know, my behavior right now could definitely save a life or not save a life. We're in a case where none of us, which none of us has ever experienced, and then expect our intuitive reaction to be a reliable guide to moral truth. That's 
That I think is hope, right? Because it, we, we simply, I mean, look, our intuitions are terrible. I mean, mathematical intuitions are terrible. Our intuitions about almost everything uh, highly underlined. Uh, and there's lots of evidence. I mean, some of that evidence is decent. You know, you take a kind of intuition and we say, well, let's look at that. Oh my God. You know, your intuition varies depending on, you know, whether you had Earl Grey or English breakfast or something like that. I mean, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's an experiment that's done that one, whether that's would survive replication or not. But um, so, so I think in general, the methodology is very common. Um, but I, I, you know, I just, I like the taste of bullying. Like bullets. Uh, so I, um, and and I mean a, a lot. Okay, cards on the table. Look, I think there are two moral intuitions that are probably reliable, and only two. Pain is bad, pleasure is good, um, and and I, and I have methodological reasons for thinking. But this isn't a talk on that. But but um, so a lot of people, you know, when I give my skepticism about intuition, they say, well, what are you supposed to do instead if you don't know all these intuitions? And I said, well, one thing you can do is that you can use them as a consistency test against people and say, okay, well, look, you know, you think this, you think that, now how do you square them? That's that's fair game. Um, but uh, just sort of building theories up from the ground floor. I, I think that uh, we just have so much evidence that the intuitions people appeal to are so easily swayed. Um, the, the premier example of the kind of uh, appeals to intuitions that I think that, uh, you know, will get you nowhere, but a lot fun to talk about is, of course, Francis Ken uh, and intricate ethics. Uh, but I think that, that, I mean, she's just one end of the spectrum. Maybe there's another so I can talk about I, I see, you know, pretty much all the ontological intuitions, I think, uh, on a par. It all comes down to fetishizing causal processes, um, doing a land distinction, and, and we'll see all kinds of stuff like that. But, but again, that's a different talk. I, 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 I'm not, I know from experience, I'm not gonna persuade you, but that's okay. <laughs> but that's what makes, you know, what makes philosophy an interesting discipline. We all agree about stuff. <laughs> you like mathematics. Of course, to which you respond, but your talk just wasn't that bad, right? Yeah, that's what you should have said. Okay. Matthew Hopper. Well, so this is a question about the more charitable penalty. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the thing I know the least about. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, so, okay. So, what happens when you're Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, I mean, what I'm told, and again, I'm trusting my physics colleagues, is that it was, it was um, uh, incalculably small. So it wasn't, because, I mean, where you're going is, yeah, that if it was way, way smaller, but how small, you know, what, if it was one in a trillion, what, I mean, well, probably going wrong. But, but I thought the, the reason you fell off the chair was because, well, if you multiply this tiny chance by, well, the chance of it bringing you back on the song is not. Yeah. Well, it's the chance of everyone in the world in future generations. Yes, that's so right. So if that were multiplying the chance by, yeah. that ceases to be bad at a certain small enough number? Um, well, <laughs> um, yeah, small enough. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what would be small enough. Again, that my again, my physicist friends, when I push them and I say, okay, so what was the actual number? Was he off by a factor of a hundred, a thousand, whatever they say? What they say is there is no number small enough to describe uh, how um, you know what the probability is. All we can say is that it's not physically impossible. Um, so, I mean, another complication, of course, and I didn't get into this, but another complication is that um, we have to, we have, you know, we. Yeah, and this gets into slight effective altruism stuff. <laughs> we have to actually believe that the survival of the human race is a good thing. Uh, and I'm not sure I believe that. Um, but so. Well, yeah, no, I, it, if it was just the human race at stake. But remember, I, you know, in fact, it's a lot more. I mean, we can't selectively. I mean, 
Yeah, if we thought, yeah, the only risk is it will swallow up all the human beings, but leave everyone else left, I would say, yeah, good, that hopefully risk is even bigger. Um, but uh, <laughs> but we can't do that. I mean, the black hole would destroy the whole planet. It wouldn't, it wouldn't selectively take human beings. Um, but you no, know, I mean, I, I do think, though, um, I mean, look, the, the heat death of the universe will wipe things out at some point. Uh, at least I believe that. Um, and, uh, and even if it didn't, I think the causally relevant future will end at some point in terms of, you know, even if the universe doesn't die a heat death, all, you know, sentient beings who are causally connected to us now, that we, you know, will come to an end. And so, in theory, there's there's a, a number that we could attach to the badness of that not happening. Um, and then the chance, you know, there will be a probability that's small enough that the expected gain, I mean, because we have to believe there's a gain from the Hegel to life. And I, you know, I, again, I trust my physics friends when they say that it's a good thing that we have this and, you know, that we're learning about stuff. So I'm no physicist. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the expected gain. Uh, would be big enough. The almost certainly that game would be big enough uh, that it would outweigh the size of the badness of that stuff not having multiplied by a number that's you know just small enough, finite but small enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm committed to that. I don't know what that number would be. I I don't think anyone should trust their intuitions if they think they can put a number on. You know, just how bad would it be that the, the planet Earth is destroyed? Um, but we, you know, that's why I was so simplified and said, okay, what if all that's at stake is seven billion human lives? And if all that's at stake is seven billion human lives, we multiply that by one in ten million, and we can see how, if I can really believe that, we would be irresponsible. We could be doing the thing to say that we thought that everyone else would say, oh, that's too small to worry. So it was just an illustration of how, you know, What's too small to worry about in one context is, is nothing like too small to worry about in both contexts. But actual number. Um, Matt Rogers, here goes Lalo. Um, I just wanted to just be, I don't understand math well enough, but when you say the number is incalculably small, what does that mean? That sounds like we just can't know what the problem is. So it's not like, yeah. you know, oh, we can say, oh, it's so small that we know yeah. that none of yeah. them are Well, no, that's a good question. Um, I, again, you know, um, I, I'm trying to remember the conversation I had with this physicist. I think, but I, you know, I didn't write this down. I think when I pushed him and I explained the concept of infinitesimals, he said, yeah, that's what I mean. So infinitesimal small. So you know, no matter how many times you add it to itself, you'll never get to a finite number. Um, so some, I mean, I don't understand infinitesimals. You know, I don't think mathematicians understand what they're talking about either. But it's supposed to be like it's non-zero. It's bigger than zero, but it's so small that no matter how many times you add it to itself, you'll never get to a finite number. It's, I think that's how infinitesimals are defined. It's been a long time since I. You know, look at that. I think, uh, and again, I'm just reporting what this physicist said. I mean, you know, he might be wrong. It might be that it really was irresponsible. Just to, to, you know, maybe we just dodged a bullet. And, you know, I like biking bullets, but, you know, uh, anyway. Um, so, yeah, I, I, maybe I just chose to be reassured by this physicist right? when I described it because he said, no, no, he was just saying that to me because he was reaching the small number. In fact, it's, um, you know, I pushed him as much as I could. Um, but yeah, maybe we should live in fear if we uh, they don't collide as far as the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I'm, I expect I'll, I'll manage to that. Matthew Adams. Oh, thank you for a fun talk. Um, I, I, I didn't want to ask about mathematics. Okay, okay, that's fine. So that's good. <laughs> I just wanted to kind of ask about the extension of your argument to both things. Yeah. Um, and I wondered it wasn't quite as convincing as the parallel animal case for a few reasons. I was looking to focus on one of the same distinction between them as theirs. Yeah. And it seems that both things is more of an opportunity cost. I mean, the opportunity cost maybe with foregoing animal products is maybe built in the cost of personal pleasure. Yeah. 
But if you're looking at both things, um, it seems that the mainstream place to be a human is the best of both things, the best that you can do to other people to the world. Nice. Um, well, that, I mean that okay, that so that's to, yeah, and that that's to give. I, I did the song with the case for the engine, right? But so I think there's lots of other actual benefits. Um, yeah. Sure, I I just think I think if you're looking at it in terms of the expected utility kind of framework, mm -hmm. it's sort of right for the effective output start to be the same. Well, yeah, but you could spend the hours that you need to be voting, doing extra work and giving that to the area foundation. Mm -hmm. And then it could take quite a few more like even more than push one. Perhaps this is depending on how the numbers work. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't so I thought that that complexity was signifying the animal space. Right. Um no, that's a good point because it, I mean one thing about the animal space is that um you gotta eat something. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's not as if yeah, right. Uh, um and and so you know, we're just asking you, you know, well, make you know, choose this rather than that. And you know, buy this thing off the shelf rather than that thing right. off the shelf, order this thing from the net. That's right. Um in the voting case, well, yeah, I mean, if you could convince me that I, you know, the time I spend voting, the tiny amount of time I spend voting. That, that you know that there's something I could do with a higher expected utility, then I think I would say, well, okay, well, you know, if you've convinced me, then uh, I have a moral reason to do that thing instead. I'm just highly skeptical uh, that there really is, partly because you know I, I think again I was giving the best case to the anti-voter. Um, and I think that even the best case, you know, the expected utility of four years of innocent, sweet grand human life. And I'd like to stress that she's sweet grand, right? Um, four, uh, you know, um, the expected, you know, the, that compared with, uh, you know, even if it's a bit of a bit of power. Um, but I mean, yeah, if you really could be. <laughs> You know, the time that you devoted to, you know, marking those things on the mail ballot that they send you really could, uh, you know, do more good than, you know, you should do, I mean, you've got a, my official view says that no such thing is true. Uh, you have a moral reason to do more good, but I, I think it would take a lot of hard and terrible work to convince me of that, but I, but I'm prepared to admit that, yeah, if you could, if you could do that, then, then, you know, and show me what I can do instead that will be it'll have high expected utility. Then I'll say, yeah, either I'll do that or I'll feel guilty about it. Well, just for what I think, even the way you describe it, it's just the time you take to tick the box, tick the box is somewhat misleading. I mean, there's also the time you spend following the politics mm -hmm. to yeah. make a position to see, but. I guess so. I mean, I, I think I know myself well enough that I, I I just know that I would not be self, you know, strong-willed enough to not follow politics to the... I mean, look, we live in a country where it doesn't take much following the politics to know who's vastly the lesser of two evils. It's not... You don't have to do a lot of, of digging for this. I mean, maybe once upon a time you did. But but now it's easy. Uh, I mean, you know, one one side has just made it very easy for the rest of us. Uh, I mean, I'm you know, you might be on that side. I don't want to assume anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm in Indiana. I, I I can't I can't make any any assumptions. I mean, you know, you're probably all reporting me now to you know, you know, the census is Florida. I don't know whoever your governor is. Okay. Is that a Democrat or Republican? <laughs> no, but um, Kansas has a Democratic uh, um, governor. I mean, there are some red states with Democratic governors. I mean, um, sorry, it happens. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, but then when you add all the other things, right? You know, all the other things on the ballot, the sense of civic engagement, the um, the how how much how it's easier to sort of build. Solidarity with people when you don't have to lie to them about having voted, you know. Um, 
I think it all it all adds up so there's a pretty strong case for it. But but I'm not saying they, you know, you couldn't. I mean, I say the chances of you persuading me otherwise are greater than infinitesimal. <laughs> but still very small. However. Oh, yeah. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. I was, I noticed that through your talk, you were careful to distinguish at times between uh, consuming animals mm -hmm. outright and consuming consuming animal products. Yeah. I was wondering how you on your account would, I don't know, maybe defend the greater utility of being a vegan over being yeah. a vegetarian. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah, no, excellent question. Um, so, well, first of all, um, a lot of animal products that aren't simply meat. So a lot of a lot of you know cheese and dairy, most of it um, does involve animal suffering as well. So the very same arguments would would involve that. Um, so I think the more challenging case is the case of supposedly humanely raised animals. And the example I give in my original article is, is designed to parallel intensive farming facilities, factory farms. But even if there are um, farms where animals are raised, you know, that, that have actual on balance net good in their lives, and you know, we get either meat or dairy or eggs uh, from them. Then the question is, okay, what justifies us in treating those creatures differently from how we would treat human beings at the same cognitive level? And so the, the second half of the article I referred to actually is the, sort of looks at the question of the moral status of humans versus animals and the attempts to give um, a higher moral status to all humans compared with animals on the grounds that so humans are rational. And then, of course, the big problem is what about those who aren't? Um, and and then it's you know that's an unanswerable objection, um, and there's Bentham's objection, which is it doesn't matter if they're rational, it's you know can they suffer? Um, so um, I I think a lot of the same arguments apply to animal products that aren't actually meat. Um, when it comes to supposedly humane farms, the case isn't as obvious against eating the products of humane farms. But um, when you look at the details of humane farming, it's not that humane. And uh, you know, uh, they still tend to die brutal deaths. Um, we certainly wouldn't approve of doing that to human beings who are at the same cognitive level. And so there's, you know, how would we justify that? So I, th I think there is still a lot to be said there. But but you're, I mean, you're absolutely right to point out that the um, the initial argument is so it takes the takes the clearest case against animal products, meat raised from factory farms, um, and then well, partly because that's the vast majority of animal products that people eat, and then um, you know the, the the case for certain other animal products is 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 not as not as strong. I think it's still strong enough. Thank you. Sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, I was just wondering if um, there was a, a meaningful difference to you between a, a decision like Stardew CERN and a decision like that is made continuously by thousands of people like you and me mm -hmm. when it comes to the expected value that your analysis does yeah. CERN like okay, there's a one in 10 million chance, but you do that once yeah. versus you're doing it millions of people are eating it every day so you can expect that value to have real meat. Yeah, no, I mean, but, um, you're raising some very sort of important issues there. I mean, one has, I mean, there, there are factors that I, you know, the pages of time that didn't get into. So, so when it comes to our dietary choices, the expected utility of us ordering a certain type of meat, you know, can be seen in a sort of discrete way and, and you know, that is small and approximately equal to the life of that much of the animal, you know, approximately equal to. But, um, but we don't, we don't just make choices like that. I think you're absolutely right. 
when people change their diet, it's a matter of the whole lifestyle, and often it involves other, other people. What is the effect on people? Um, so, I mean, there's always a tricky practical issue that I face, which is, you know, how much do I talk to other people about veganism? I mean, do I want to sort of be part of the stereotype that you want to be in? Um, and, and I don't mind that if it will be effective. My worry is that it would be counterproductive. And so then you have to sort of say, okay, well, you take your audience and different things work for different people. And, you know, maybe the most effective thing I can do with some people is just invite them over and serve them very tasty food and then reveal that there were no animal products in them. I run a conference every year, by the way, people should all buy the Rocky Mountain Ethics Congress, very friendly to grad students. We serve, you know, uh, a reception of just vegan food, and um, typically people will remark, this is really good. Oh, no, that's not possible. Yes, the one. <laughs> no, there you go. Well, I tricked you. Uh, <laughs> I do let people order, order meat actually for a sandwich, but I describe it in such a way that made me feel really guilty. Um, <laughs> yeah, mostly because it's, you know, people know it's guilty, but it's guilty, but not guilty. <laughs> um, so um, you, you're right that there are, uh, I mean, psychologically, there's a big difference between like a one off decision where you just assign a particular possibility and, and, and then, you know, it's to the outcome. And sort of continuous behavior, which impacts not just this meal or that meal, but you know, a lifestyle choice that affects you and other people. And, and, and I think, you know, that makes the case for, you know, dietary change all the stronger because there's so many other aspects to add to it. So my claim is that even if it was just a second utility, just this bit of meat, it would still be enough. Uh, but in fact, it's a lot more than that. Um, and there's, you know, I mean, it's all telling, but I believe in virtues. I, I mean, I don't think they're fundamentally valuable. And, and I think that, you know, cultivating virtue, you know, virtuous character traits is important. And that I think, you know, one of the things that helps us cultivate virtuous character traits is just seeing other sentient creatures as sort of fellow members of, of a community that's, that's morally significant and not as resources for us to exploit. I mean, if I'm not careful, I can sound almost Kantian. Um, and then, you know, and he forbid, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think a, a lot of the sentiments behind Kantianism are quite admirable. It's just that, uh, I mean, Tom Reagan, who famously described himself as an animal Kantian, said the important thing is that experiencing subjects of a life are not our resources to exploit, and that's what's fundamentally wrong. I disagree with his claim that's what's fundamentally wrong, but I agree that that's a really important virtuous character not to see sentient creatures like that. Um, so yeah, I thank you. Uh, I think that's a really important point to bear in mind. And and I, I hope I may say it, it's a lot lower than not intended. <laughs> Again, I hope so. Would be would be super delighted. Yeah. So we unfortunately have six minutes left and seven people in the queue. Oh, it's my fault. Talk which you. means that um, I'm sorry that most of the people who are in the queue won't have a chance to ask their questions here, but conversation can, can continue at the reception. You can treat me as a hostile witness and just ask yes or no questions. <laughs> Marcia. I'll pass if there's somebody who's on the top. And they all should know. Okay. okay. Um, so, uh, Joshua. Oh, oh goodness. Okay, we're going to mind. Okay, the answer is yes to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'll be pretty quick. So, I agree about the problems and stuff they mentioned that saying, except like one kind of case where for practical reasons, so I think I'm going to be quick. Sure. Imagine a world in which no vegetarian meat is currently. Yeah. And then the young door crops decides, oh, it's on beat animals. <laughs> right? So, it's not just a question of the utility calculation of no longer eating animals. It's also now you have a monumental political task in your head. Yeah. And it seems to me an open question of that would be paralyzed. Like you would be so full of anxiety about trying to fulfill this mission of your life mm -hmm. that it seems to me that even on utilitarian grounds, you might be justified in not pursuing it, which seems counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm still stuck on the young locos. I remember those days. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 
That that is yeah, that's certainly a tricky one. Um, I mean, in a sense, I mean, obviously it's simplified, but in a sense, that's the situation that Peter Singer found himself in in 1971. Um, when 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 fatigued with the the sweet ladies of, of the you know RSPCA, they heard he was concerned about animals and they wanted to talk to them. He, he, this is all his introduction to um um what's the animal book? Um uh, animal liberation, yeah. And uh, and 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 they served in ten sandwiches. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so he, he was like, whoa. Um, so yeah. Um, I mean, maybe I'm unjustly confident, uh, and so I maybe it's a bit of arrogance on my part. I rarely found myself sort of paralyzed with, you know. I mean, yeah, I think okay, yeah. Well, I'll give it the old college try. I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, that, I mean, luckily, I would say luckily that's not the world we live in. <laughs> luckily, there is a movement, a growing movement, and there's all kinds of connections, there's all kinds of other effects we can have. But uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm just very glad that that's not the situation. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't think you oh, Carter. Carter. Oh, <clears throat> yeah. Yes. I knew his name. Oh, um, that's because you were both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you refer to another word. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the thrust of your presentation is about why we should follow these uh, ethical arguments for veganism, right? And for not um, eating animals, for not contributing to. Um, why we shouldn't follow the arguments against the argument. No, hang on. But, I, I, hang on. I, I'm giving you an argument why you shouldn't eat animals, right? Yes. And, and so, why I'm giving you an argument. Why you shouldn't follow the criticism of the lab. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Right. So uh, it seems like with this sort of um, with the framework you put forward for why why we should look at the expected utility mm -hmm. of different um, of different choices. Uh, it, it seems like when there is a comparison of expected utility of, of other actions, it could it could lead to maybe strange conclusions. So if more meat eaters, uh, for example, uh, and I would say like meat eaters are kind of perceived as a normal, as like a, a normal condition. If, if you're a meat eater, you can sort of relate to somebody else when they eat meat, because it's something you can't do. Vegans, um, if they took, made the decision to maybe promote more alternative proteins, which is mm -hmm. a rapidly growing industry that's mm -hmm. probably one of the best ways, you know, consequentialists can look for to Push push out the market niche of factory farming, which is like really really low cost yeah. animal products. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it seems almost like you could make a really strong case that a meat eater who eats alternative proteins, even at a at a, at a pace of you know once a week or less, could be uh, taking an action that's more expected utility than somebody who goes totally vegan and forgoes animal products. So like thinking from uh, a, a hypothetical person who wants to defend their they're eating meat mm -hmm. uh, at least occasionally. It seems like they could make a pretty strong argument on the on the on the grounds that um, okay, if I'm if I'm supporting this alternative protein industry, it's a much higher leverage activity to eventually at least push out this niche of factory farming by popularizing this. You know, using all of this sort of what you're mentioning, people are uh, these companies are tracking your purchases, and mm -hmm. you know, it, there's a much smaller number of people who are willing to go and use these alternative proteins at these earlier stages, mm -hmm. um, and so therefore the people who do are are you know disproportionately affecting the the growth of this industry. So can you give me one example of the alternative protein you're thinking of? Impossible offers at Burger King. Oh yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so I mean, I've had one of those. Yeah. Uh, first time I went to Burger King many years just because they had it, and I thought that's why. I mean, it's not as good as you know when you make it at home. It's still. Um, so why why would a meat eater have an impossible offer? I mean, is it like a, are you saying that it's a precedent effect? So other people would look at the meat eater and say, well, he's eating an impossible offer, so I should do it too. But if they look at me. They'll say, well, obviously he's eating as possible. Is that the idea? Yeah, it, it's that. And then it's also like, I don't want this question to boil down to a classic utilitarian sort of thing of like, oh, you know, if well, I'm doing one thing that's, you know, <laughs> outweighing all the bad things I'm doing, I can still do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but, yeah. so I mean, the idea is well, look, you, you'll be more, 
you'll better relate to people if they if you're an innkeeper and and so you'll be able to persuade them more. I mean, the obvious answer is, well, you know, don't be an innkeeper, but make people think you are. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, give up eating meat, but don't tell your friends you give up. I mean, if, if that argument really works, say, yeah, no, I love steak, but I had the muscle burger and, and, and it's great. Right. Oh wow, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah, I mean, but, but you know, just don't tell them that in fact you haven't eaten steak for a, a long time. I mean, look, look, I mean, lying in a good cause is is is, is fine. Don't listen to the Canadians to tell you it's not. <laughs> but but. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I would mind when I said that. I, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I, I that's partly what I, you know, what I meant when I said, um, you know, you have to look at the different leaders to, to press depending on you know where you're situated. If it's true that you have access to more leaders to press, if people think you're like them, then that's reason to encourage people to think you're like them. And if you're actually not like them, just be, you know. Be good at acting. Um, I mean, I mean, this sounds callous, but we're talking about billions of sentient beings here. So you know, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's, it's not even your, you know, the inquiring murderer at the door and your friend hiding in the bed. I mean, it's much more important than that. Billions of sentient beings. So yeah, that doesn't justify lying. What would? Uh, and just one really quick follow up: Does this imply that we have, or that it's plausible that we could have a stronger moral obligation to uh, eat impossible whoppers than if we have to give up meat? So, uh, I, uh, if, I guess, I, I guess if the, yeah. if the context fitted, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, look, I'm an internal parent, so yeah. Could this be the case? Well, yeah. If you, if you, you know, describe the causal nexus fitting enough. In enough detail that it actually works out. Sure, I I, mean, I I don't think it's true in general. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, if, if I thought that I really ought to eat more impossible poppers, then I I would I would do that. I mean, I eat lots of impossible burgers, but I I think I would even go to that. But yeah, um, but yeah, actually, maybe I I sh really should eat more of them to encourage Burger King to keep serving them, which would encourage other people to try them. Yeah. Yeah, so, so is that what we're going for dinner? You'll have to ask Matthew. We'll say it's so amazing. So, we should send it to you. But yeah, well, we are, it's a tricky question, but thank you. So, we are a uh, little past the end of our time, um, so we're going to wrap up. But for those of you who are still in the queue, I apologize, and we'll have time for a conversation at the reception. Um, let's thank our speaker. <laughs>